I really love Omega. I think they're fantastic watchmakers, and I own two of their watches. But I'm starting to worry a little that they're becoming more exclusive and a bit more like Rolex. So before I jump fully into today's video, I'm going to do a drinks check and a wristwatch check. So starting off my wristwatch check, I'm wearing the Cavalli in forest green on a Stingray green strap. I think this combination is super nice for the summer weather and it's just so beautiful today. I had to wear it. It's just so lovely. Now for the drink of choice today is the Glen Marnock from Aldi. This is about £17 and this is their green variant. So let's take a little sip of this. Um, I've had loads of comments from you guys suggesting different whiskies, so I'm hopefully going to order some taster whiskies for upcoming videos as well. So look forward to those. So if you have any other drinks to recommend, definitely leave it down in the comments section. I'm open to all different types of drinks, not just whiskies. So uh, let's give this a sip. Let me uh, quickly read off what it's meant to taste like. Okay, so it's meant to taste vanilla oakiness, whatever that means. So uh, let's take a sip, see what we think. Is smooth. It's definitely smoother than the purple label. I can sort of get a bit of oakiness, but not really any vanilla coming through at all. Let me take another another sip. Hmm. No, no, definitely no vanilla, but it's very sort of mellow, this whiskey. I quite like it, actually. It's nice. So this past weekend, I went down to Cardiff, and while I was down there, I took a little trip to the Watches of Switzerland boutique, to where I was really surprised to see a watch that I've been waiting for for almost a year to finally see in person. This was the Omega Ultra D, a watch that is frankly absurd in its capabilities and highly unreasonable to ask of anyone to really own, because I mean, who wants a watch that's standing an inch off your wrist and can go down to 6,000 meters? I mean, it's just sort of a bit over the top, but I thought it was actually really cool and I really liked it and thought it was surprisingly wearable. So I was talking to a member of staff about the model when she told me this was the first watch that she's had of this model in store at all since its release. Now that's almost a year and this is the first one they've had. So she told me that there's several watches like this where they're not limited, they're not exclusive, but they're very rare to actually find in boutiques and a lot of the time when they do come in they're bought straight away so there is a bit of almost like a wait list even though there's not really an official wait list. The other watches she'd mentioned were the green Omega 300M as well as the brand new 60th anniversary Bond edition. So those watches I was already aware of so I did a little bit of research and there are so many other watches that Omega is not really allowing you to buy online straight away. So or you can't just find it in boutiques either. So the 60th anniversary is quite a given. I expected that because it's so popular, such a popular design. But there are even more now. So the Aquaterra, the new 38 millimeters, all the color variants, you can't just buy them online. They're, they're boutique only. And um, as far as I'm aware, I haven't seen it in any boutique. So one indicator to point to the fact that Omega is becoming more exclusive is the rising prices. Now, I've mentioned this several times before, and everyone always tells me, yeah, inflation, everything's going up, but not this much. I mean, the Omega 300M is going up at a rate which is just unparalleled to any other real model in Omega's collection. It's sort of a bit ludicrous that the Omega 300M has almost surpassed the Aquaterra, when the Aquaterra has always been the more expensive, bigger brother. Now, Omega may not let this happen, and they might just bump up the price of the Aquaterra to stop this from happening. But it does feel like Omega's rising the price to make it almost more exclusive, cutting off the gateway for a lot of normal people that are working normal jobs. They can't therefore get these once obtainable watches, pushing them further and further from the grasp of the everyday man or woman. But I don't really understand why they're doing this, unless they're trying to, like I said, become more exclusive and become similar to Rolex in the way that people want what they can't have. And if they keep rising the prices, they're going to get more demand. It's an interesting thought. So something Omega can do to try and combat this rise in price is quite simple, and it's something that Rolex have even started to do, which is have an official pre-owned market hosted by them. So what I mean is, why doesn't Omega have a service where you can trade in your old Omega and maybe get a discount on a new Omega? 
and then they can sell and authenticate the old Amiga and sell it on their website for a discounted price. I know this isn't really like watch companies, but it just seems very logical. And therefore people can, if they can't afford the modern brand new models, they can maybe look at a few years ago and maybe get a model that's like my Aqua Terra, it's five years old, it looks fantastic. And although it's not the latest model, it still is very nice to have. And I think people would really appreciate that. Now, I'm obviously not saying Rolex is perfect because no one's really seen how this pre-owned system is going to work yet because it's not really fully implemented. So it may just be a total scam. But I think they're going in the right direction by having a pre-owned market that's authenticated by the company itself. So far in this video, I've only really mentioned Rolex as a comparison to Amiga, which isn't really fair because there's so many different watch brands on the market that I need to introduce some other rivals to Amiga. So I'm going to go with one slightly above Amiga and one slightly below. So we have Cartier, which is now surpassing Amiga in sales, and Grand Seiko, which is slightly more expensive than Amiga, but is obviously really high quality finishing for the price. So Grand Seiko, what do I think of them? Well, I've only ever got hands on with one Grand Seiko ever, and I just feel like overall their presence is really lackluster and their website is so poorly made, it's almost determined to stop you from finding the watch you're after. Now, Cartier, I just don't really have any interest. I just, I'm sorry, but I just can't really fall in love with a Santos or a Tank or any other model. I just don't really enjoy them. They just, they just don't really appeal to me. I'd rather have a Reverso any day of the week. So let's talk about Rolex again. I mean, they have wait lists. So, so does Amiga. They have wish lists. But I think that they're not really comparable because, I mean, the wish lists with Amiga, it almost seems like you're going to get the watch. Whereas the Rolex, you just, you're on like a, a really thin strand that can get cut any time there's a new release. So I don't really like comparing those two because they're not really similar. And the majority of watches you can just buy on Amiga's website, whereas Rolex, you can't buy any of them at all. So my takeaway from the video is the following. Omega, if you would just take a step back and try and slow down your price increases just slightly, or maybe implement a pre-owned authenticated marketplace for the customers that can't afford the brand new models, I think you're going to be a very, very strong rival to Rolex for many, many years to come. And although Rolex may have the sales and the demand, I think Omega is going to be the people's champion for decades to come. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you think down below in the comments section. And then if you haven't subscribed already, why not? It's free. Just like the video anyway while you're down there. Thank you so much for watching. Until this video though, goodbye.